In this book, I will take you, the reader, with me into the secret inner world of the pimp. I will lay bare my life and thoughts as a pimp. The account of my brutality and cunning as a pimp will fill many of you with revulsion. I regret that it is impossible to recount to you all of my experiences as a pimp. Perhaps my remorse for my ghastly life will diminish to the degree that within this one book, I have been allowed to purge myself. If prostitution is known as the oldest profession, then pimping is the second oldest profession. Well. Do you want to go get a room? Yeah, I'm on. Right now, it's been taken out of context because mainstream has adapted and adopted that word and adopted the formula of pimping and thinking that they know what it is. But pimping is a player sending a bitch to the corner to get money. There's a fascination with any time you don't have to work for money. Whoever's doing the least amount for some cash, that is fascinating. It's like, what? What's he do? She does the work, he gets... Well, I, I, gotta, I gotta figure out how I get into this, you know? You had to know how to control and how to operate a stable, how to dazzle, befuddle, bewitch, entrance, and hypnotize a woman. Not only one woman, but eight, nine. And to keep them in harmonious effort. And if you think that is the job, my friend, you ask any married man. Iceberg Slim is the name that is synonymous with the pimp game. He's a writer uh, who lived an incredible life and wrote books that I grew up on. I loved him, and I told him that every single time I talked to him because he was my god. Runs the ladies, has the rap, the clothes, the jewelry, the drugs, has done time, street cred by the truckload. Iceberg Slim was a guy who actually lived the life that he was writing about. Pimp might be my favorite book of all time. Yeah, I checked it out. The P-I-M-P. Pimp had a big impact on the game. It gave basic instructions of how to play the game. It was just amazing, the thought of that. It was just fascinating. He would paint beautiful pictures using ugly paint, you know? You know, just ringing, like, looking around and just finding the beauty and the appreciation of wherever you are, be it in the ghetto or in a high-class neighborhood, and showing that it's okay to stumble, but it's not okay to fall, you know? Always get back up and you keep going. His books tell the truth about the life. There was no one more eloquent than Iceberg Slim, or no more poetic, or more accurate in terms of describing where he came from. I was in a bar, and there was a fellow arguing with another fellow. And this fellow drew a gun and fired at the fellow, and the bullet went through my hat. I was full of cocaine at the time, and I didn't react. So my friend said, man, you were so cool. He says, you were icy. And they called me Iceberg Slim. Big guys, but she full of surprises. I swear this bitch is shady. That's what I know. Sex on her mind all the time, and you think that that's your baby. You don't know. You a good guy that's living a lie, but she told them where you're safe. That's what I know. If you cool and she's satisfied, how come that bitch just pays me? You don't know. When you're dealing with pimps and hoes, they have to look the part. So as a kid, you know, some preacher walks in, it's like, yeah, whatever. Some pimp walks in, and you know, you can hear church miles piss on the carpet, it's so quiet. The first stages of my own street poisoning uh, happened when I was a boy, and my mother had a beauty shop, and she catered to uh, a colony of uh, black hookers and pimps. And these fellows would be decked out in, in all their finery with all the diamonds and all the rest of it. And of course, they're women. A pimp was held in regard like an athlete or entertainer. 
He wasn't like an advocate of peace or violence. He was more or less like a hero. A pimp is judged by his flash, you know what I mean? His Cadillac, his house, his jewelry, his clothes. That's how you size up a pimp economy. Well-groomed, smell good, you know, everything. Because you're trying to outmatch this female. You want that woman to look at you and say, this is the finest man I've ever seen. I mean, the immaculate dresser, I mean, hair cloth, brand new Cadillac every year. When you were a kid, you know, somebody had a brand new Cadillac every year. He was something. And that's the first time that I was impressed. Because you must remember, back in those days, if you were black, your opportunities were so narrow. Black person born during that time, what you were dealing with was almost beyond words. Those race riots in Chicago started because the black kid swam into an area that was whites only. Since the time when she was six months pregnant, my father had begun to show his true colors. After my birth, he got worse and had the stupid gall to suggest to Mama that I be put on a Catholic church doorstep. Mama naturally refused, so he hurled me against the wall in disgust. I survived it, and he left us. Came from a single parent home. His mom, you know, by hook or by crook, she needed to put food on the table, you know, and to put food on the table, she had to be out and about in the world to do so. And it was just unfortunate, you know, that she, you know, entrusted a baby boy into the hands of the wrong person. In the opening of Pimp, the way that he describes his initial foray into the world of pimping is through being sexually abused by his babysitter, Maude. I remember more vividly the moist, odorous darkness and the bristle-like hairs tickling my face. And most vividly, I can remember my panic when in the wild moment of her climax, she would savagely jerk my head even tighter into the hairy maw. Right off the bat, he's subjected or dominated by a forceful woman who sexualizes him. He's uh, taught about the whole nature of uh, sexual dominance. And then later, he has negative experiences with his mother. She hooks up with a man named Henry Upshaw, Successful man, loved her to death, loved her and loved her son. It's the only man in Iceberg's life that he talks about, identifies with, and talks about in not only a respectful way, but someone who really touched his heart and soul because he really cared about him as a human being. With Henry Upshaw, things were idyllic until his mother met a con man named Steve. He was one of Mary's customers in her beauty shop. He was a real slick hustler, and he essentially hustled her and convinced her to leave with him to Chicago. His mother falls for the con on Henry Upshaw and fucks up everything. <laughs> fucks up everything, fucks up all the stability, fucks up, like, his, like, one shot. Really, it's the only shot he's got. What's so upsetting to Iceberg is not just that his mom has ripped, ripped him away from a mooring from a foundation that he's found, but the way she does it. If I can never forget that morning when Mama had finished packing our clothes and Henry lost his inner fight for his pride and dignity. He fell down on his knees and bawled like a scalded child, pleading with Mama not to leave him. I will never forget her face as cold as an executioner's, which she was, as she kicked and struggled loose from him. Then with an awful grin on her face, she lied and said, Henry, honey, I just want to get away for a while. Darling, we'll be back. To see his mother betray 
off the only man he ever loved, he learned that there's one thing I'm not gonna be is those guys. I'm gonna get her before she gets me because I know she's gonna betray me. She then conspires with Steve to take off her ex-husband's loot. From that, he lost all respect for women, in a sense. It's like, even you fell for this shit? And in a sense, she created the pimp. When the money runs out, and she's essentially outlived her usefulness, Steve starts to show his true colors when he starts kicking her ass. And this Steve is like one of the cruelest motherfuckers I've ever seen in a book. Like, he murders his kitten, like, right in front of him. Like, who does that? Steve had stomped on three and a half years of our lives. I would soon be 14. On August 4th, my birthday, Mama came home from the hospital with her broken jaw wired and her body covered with bruises. Steve had attacked her with his fists and feet and then escaped through the grimy catacombs of the ghetto. And she was alone in the streets and trying to find work. We're talking about during the Depression when People are, not black people, only people are suffering. She left the iceberg by himself a lot and isolated this little place that they had. And he discovered the streets. The slide was greased. I was starting my long plunge to the very bottom of the grim pit. My trip downward really was cinched when I met a petty hustler who was very likable and we became pals. My hustler pal was called Party Time. He had a head full of wild, risky hustles he wanted to try. He needed a partner. Party Time, he was this real knowledgeable brother, so he was able to give Ice the rundown. He was able to break it down in the simplest terms, like, you know, and not become cross with him if he didn't catch on right away. Even though I had started to rot inside from the street poisoning, Amazingly, at 15, I graduated from high school with a 98.4 average. I got a scholarship to go to college. And I got it by daydream. But I was able to retain enough of the information so that the black Tuskegee Club sent me to Tuskegee and during the Depression. This is the, the home of Booker T. Washington, one of the most powerful black leaders ever. Immediately, because I was already street poisoned, I started bootlegging on campus in Alabama, OK? So I got expelled. I was sent home. So my mother sat down, and her words of wisdom come back to me now. She said, Bobby, apparently, you like to run and associate with bad people, with street people. She says, you can become a criminal lawyer. He says, and make them pay you. He said, Bobby, get your education, become a criminal lawyer, and get a license to associate with the people that you admire and like so much. Now, have you ever heard anything more wise than that? 1937, he's out of Tuskegee. He's in Milwaukee. He comes across a woman named Pepper Ibbets. Bobby Beck thought he was the slickest guy on earth. But as slick as he thought he was, Pepper Ibbets was even slicker. As fast as he thought he was, she was 10 times faster. She was older than he was. She was an ex-prostitute. She had been around. She had married a white guy. She had money. She introduced him to cocaine. She turned him out. I was just a hep punk. I wasn't in her league. That freak bitch cajoled and persuaded me to do everything in the sexual book. What a thrill for a dog like her to turn out a tender fool like me. If Pepper had lived in the old biblical city of Sodom, the citizens would have stoned her to death. She had his nose wide open and she had him jumping out the window, so to speak, and doing things that he normally probably wouldn't have done. He later got double-crossed into prison. It was Pepper and a cop named Delansky, along with an unknown heist man, he got charged with accessory to robbery. An 18-year-old black man being sent to a reformatory back in the 1930s and 40s would have been very, very likely subjected to all sorts of racism, 
At that time, many of the guards, or probably most of them, would have been white. They knew that they could push them around, perhaps physically abuse them. He probably got treated very, very poorly. It was there, in the dormitory, that I got the insatiable desire to pimp. I was a member of a clique that talked about nothing except whores and pimping. I began to feel a new slickness and hardness. He's like a sponge. He's soaking up all these stories and all the game these different guys are running down. And he's plucking out the best parts to apply to what he's trying to do. He wanted to master manipulating the psychology of the hoes and the women. When he started to realize that the best pimps, that is to say the most successful ones, were the ones with the coldest, with the least emotion, the real iceberg heart. With good time, I was free, slick, and bitter. No more small towns for me. I was going to the city to get my degree in pimping. When you're black, my friend, and you get twisted, one's ego needed to be thought of as great and grand. And this was a way to do it to have your own little kingdom. When I first uh, got to Chicago, I had this wild dream of picking the brain of the town's top pimp, and eventually I did. My, in retrospect now, I suppose I could say that, that I wanted to be like God for a whore, you see. Chicago at that period of time was profoundly saturated with every kind of element you could think of. There were very, very good people and very, very bad people. I come from that life, and I come from Chicago. Every street had a gang, and all we saw were machine guns and dead bodies, everything. Harlem and Watts and Compton, man, was like Boys Town. I was nothing after Chicago, man, because my Chicago was rough, man. During those days, in the 40s, you could either be a barber, you could be a lawyer if your parents had money, you could be a boxer, you could be a musician, or you could be a pimp. We saw pimps everywhere. Serious, serious pimps. I don't mean Jerry Carl pimps. Baby Bell was the big pimp in Chicago. Baby Bell was phenomenal, man. He was big time. It's a level that players want to reach. Baby Bill used to travel with 32 pieces of luggage. Do you hear me? And he used to have white women. And this was at an early time when this was a no-no. Once you're in the street, you need father figures, because you don't just walk out in the street and become the greatest pimp in the world by osmosis. You need to learn. So in a way, uh, a cat like Baby Bell, you know, Bell is like uh, a father figure as well as a, a teacher, as well as a professor, you know, uh, a mentor. I became a pimp uh, primarily because of the, uh, the influence of, of well-heeled pimps and other hustlers during uh, a period of dire poverty in my life. And I feel that... Uh, I was influenced by the flashy glamour, the uh, infestation of diamonds on these uh, hustlers, and also by their big flashy cars. And I wanted a sense of importance. There was an area on the south side of Chicago called 39th and Cottage Grove, and basically it was a red light district, and Iceberg Slim was one of the neighborhood role models. When I first heard Iceberg Slim, my impression of him was a, a towering intellect. He was talking about the economics of sexual intercourse and how he uh, looked upon what he was doing as a broker. You know, a lot of people think that top pimps are dummies. That's not true. They're just perverted. <laughs> I've never known a top pimp who didn't have a high IQ. 
Actually, I think he would have been a good salesperson. Do you know how, how it takes a lot to sell a woman, to make a woman sell her body? Most of the prostitutes that I've known and the ones that I've controlled were uh, fascinated and bewitched uh, by my phony glamour, uh, the poisonous pimp charisma. And they lived in my reflected glory, so to speak. It gave them a sense of importance. What is the life of a prostitute like? It's got to be holy hell. Uh, the booby traps in the street, the death traps in the street for a prostitute. Uh, her life, uh, the life of a prostitute is filled with tension and the pressure of the pimp. Hope this won't mind asking you in here for a drink after meeting you on the street there. No, I'm not here to drink, but where is it to go? Well, I think I'm entitled to have a drink with you since I haven't seen you in 14 years. Oh, sure, glad to see you too, behind that time. Yeah, I mean, when I had you, you were, you know, a commando. Oh, yeah. Tell me, uh, baby, just, just why did you square up? When everything was getting rough out there, and the way they're killing girls and taking their money. That's where you're not square up behind that. I'm still a dime. Might not wake up the next morning. Sometimes you're scared to trust your own man. He might put a pillow over your head or something. So that's the way life is. Slim tells his girls they can leave whenever they get ready. But they don't want to leave because he's too good to them. But they must get the money. Otherwise, you're fired or something like that. Can you imagine a pimp firing a whore? <laughs> My total image of myself was that I was some sort of black, evil Swingali. When you look at old pictures of him, you see this, you see this face that this, this mask he wore. There was no emotion, no emotion whatsoever. His foot had no problem binding his way to a woman's ass. Iceberg had no hesitation at all about taking two lines of cocaine so they could slap up his fiction on. Brutality was the name of the game. First of all, you'd spell out your rules and regulations. And if any of those rules were broken, yeah. You had to punish him. He would visualize being cold as a refrigerator, being cold as a freezer, where he would be able to guard his emotions against rival pimps, cops, his women. They were never able to read him. I've had hundreds of women. I never admitted to one that I ever had a problem. Or that anything worried me. And that's the secret. He said he was a psychopath. He said he, he got a thrill out of degrading women and hurting them, brutalizing them, keeping a relentless psychological and physical pressure on them. I wanted that thrill, that voluptuous sensation of controlling a stable of women. He had to grab that intellect, grab that spirit, grab that, that hope. And um, he was, I don't, I don't think there was anybody better at it than him. He said, the hardest thing for me to do every day was to say something to my stable that would confound their mind to mentally keep them in check. At the end of the day, there's only one game. It's you either work for somebody or you have people work for you. Pimping is no different, you know? Uh, if you really break it down to the lowest level, it's using your finesse and your charisma to convince somebody to do what you want them to do. You can't be a normal person, not and succeed in that life. And you've got to be absolutely unflappable. What you do, literally, is play God. When you have five or six hoes, every one of them thinks their man is God. He said, that's why you don't have sex with them very often. You got to be God. And hey, if she can touch God anytime she wants, then he's not God anymore. 
The life of a pimp is unremitting tension and pressures. Uh, a, a pimp uh, lives on the precipice of disaster. I think he's the most hated and feared creature of the underworld. All of us, honey, all of us. To try to actually control a female who's basically a criminal, a robber, a thief, to get that to operate under your motivation is not an easy thing to do. You know what I'm saying? So I tell cats, I'm like, you do better selling drugs. At least a key of dope won't wake up in the middle of the night and kill you for something you said to it earlier that day. Holding a stable together requires the pimp to keep each individual member of the stable in apparent competition. Because of the nature of the prey, and I don't have to tell you gentlemen how cunning they are. The enemy. Your word got to be law. Even if you tell that female, I'm not going to accept you or George you or give you any love until you give me my money. You got to mean that. You got to keep your gang live and let them know that you down and that you about your money. It's a skull game. Pimping is a skull game. It's a game of manipulative psychology. And believe me, to really be a pimp takes a lot. The average man walking up down the street, he may be under the impression that he can pimp. But when he's put to the test, he'll flunk. My brother, my, my older brother Shabazz, had, um, when he got out of jail, he changed his name from Charles to Shabazz. He became a five percenter. And, um, you know, there was Korans and a bunch of, you know, Islamic literature. And then every Iceberg Slim book was right next to it. It was December 1945. For seven years, I devoted myself to getting hip to that pimp's book. I had thought and acted like a black god. Six months later, Sweet called me. He said, Berg, I got a why the FBI's quizzing whores. They're trying to build a five or six count rap against you. He's picked up for violating the Man Act. Two of his women, his, his bottom woman of many years, Phyllis, his first woman, turned state's evidence against him. He was incarcerated in Leavenworth. The alma mater of Machine Gun Kelly, Bugs Moran, Al Capone. Iceberg Slim writes about a psychiatrist in the 1940s that he encountered in prison. Uh, the psychiatrist came from a psychoanalytical background and believed that pimps, particularly black pimps, had a real hatred of their mothers. The person that had the greatest effect on him psychologically was his mother. He didn't want to keep hurting his mother. And yet, there was part here that was a divided soul because there were also parts of him that were angry at his mother and held things against his mother, which really psychologically had some things to do with the way he treated other women and his utter disrespect for women. My reputation coming up, before I got street poisoned, all of my mother's friends, all of my uh, associates' mothers and fathers, th they all thought I was the most charming, the sweetest. They used to talk about, oh, your son is so sweet. Oh, he's such a gentleman. You see what I mean? So to get from, from that A to the horrific Z, a pimping required more of me than it did the average person. Which I think played out in his uh, very, very direct experiences with some of the girls in his stable, including the girl who he beat violently and at the same time wanted to nurture and hold and hug. But I always had that sucker streak in me. I don't mean that it compromised my, my pimping, but I, it was always there. You can't just dog a woman out 
and just gorilla pimp a bitch to death. There's got to be some compassionate pimping in there, some soft sauce, some tender loving pimping in there. Because if you're constantly with the women, you got to have a natural feeling for them. They're getting you money, you respecting them, you actually being a father figure to them. 28 years old, he's released from Leavenworth, he's back on the street, flat on his ass. So he automatically, his first thought is like, okay, I need to get my, my, my pimp game back up. He has no other alternative but to turn to a strong arm robbery. And within a month, bam, he, he's back in the slammer. He's sentenced to the Cook County House of Corrections for a year. They put him on the coal pile. Never done a hard day's work in his life. Pimp on the coal pile is like oil and water. So Good Friday, 1947, he escaped. He's a fugitive from justice. He's running all over the Midwest with eight prostitutes. And he's an addict of heroin and cocaine. Did you make a lot of money? Oh. But where did it go? In my arm? In a blizzard of cocaine? Up my nose? All kinds of clothes? Spinning it across the bar in cabarets. Dope is maybe one of the greatest pimps to ever live. Because anybody who uses dope and get hooked, gets hooked on dope, you are whole. And the dope is pimping you. When you're in the life, you never realize that you're going to get old. That never occurs to you because the drugs keep you uh, in, a, in a trance. By the late 1950s, he's got his girls in whorehouses, he gets busted, they run his fingerprints and find out he's an escaped convict. His run in the game is over. He's sentenced back to the House of Corrections. He does nine months in solitary confinement. I looked around my new home. It was a tight box designed to crush and torture the human spirit. I raised my arms above me. My fingertips touched the cold steel ceiling. I stretched them out to the side. I touched the steel walls. The mattress cover was stained and stinking from old puke and crap. It wasn't just the cell. It was the sights and sounds of the misery and torment on the road. At the end of the fourth month, my skull was shaking on my shoulders like I had palsy. He said that he would have to do things to strengthen his mind to keep from going crazy. His writing may have actually begun in that prison world, in that setting, where he started creating stories, whether about his own life or fictional ones. He said, I had to play mental games with myself, and I had to have certain conversations to just keep me going. He said, because I was determined that the man was not going to break me. I could just lay right down. I'll tell you, children, I could lay right down. He had a lot to cope with. Um, his best friend, Joe Party Tom Evans, was killed. Baby Bell was dead. He gets a letter from his mother and that she's very sick and that he needs to get out to Los Angeles. I had come to a decision in that awful cell. I was through with pimping and drugs. I had found out that pimping is for young men, the stupid kind. I got insight that perhaps I could never have hoped to get outside. I could see the terrible pattern of my life. Mama might die in California at any time. I had to get to her before she died. I had to convince her I loved her. I had to get there as much for myself as for her. Here he is, he's struggling, trying to keep his sanity. And during this time, he finds out they may tack on more time. He may not get out when they tell him that he's supposed to be released. In order to secure his freedom, on the day that he is supposed to be released, he writes a letter to the warden in which he makes a legal-sounding plea 
for his release. Using the pen and the paper to get somewhere in life for the first time was cathartic for him. This is when he became a writer, in effect, and uh, that writing then and later on enabled him to leave uh, the penitentiary, enabled him to leave the life of crime uh, behind. And so through writing, he really did change his life. Writers are born and not created. So that gene, that genius gene, has always been there somewhere inside. You just take something to trigger it. He says, I hated being in the steel casket where they locked me away. But they saved my life. Because if I had tried to continue on, I wouldn't have lived. He said, so I knew that I was going to leave the street life alone and do whatever I had to do to straighten up and lead a, a different kind of life. Los Angeles becomes the end point of his journey because he's trying to get back to Mama. I had no one except Mama. My coming to her had been like a miracle. It was the magic that gave her strength. She told me that I should get married and have children. I had come out here to California because I was just bored, so I came out of here. <clears throat> I had worked for a hamburger stand, and so this guy started stopped by there. He looked like a professional to me, either a doctor, a lawyer, or a president of some bank. Impeccably dressed. Shoes shined, a car spotless, just unbelievable. He said, could I take you somewhere where you could eat something besides a hamburger? I said, what the hell? So we go and we eat. And um, I drank too much, which I usually did back in those days. I drank all of my whiskey and all of anybody else's whiskey I could get my hands on. And I got sick like I had never been sick before in my life. And he took me to the emergency room. The doctor said that I was, um, almost, I was four months, around four months pregnant. I said, you've got to be lying. And he said, no. And then I started crying and Bob came in. He said, what's the matter? I said, didn't they tell you what's wrong with me? And he said, yeah. I said, and, and who's going to help take care of me? And he said, I am. So he took me over to the apartment where he was living with his mother. He married a man that worked for the railroad. His name was Beck. That's why Bob took Beck as the last name. When he brought me in there, then, of course, immediately, the wheels started turning in her mind and she would go back and she would say baby don't you you get away from him Bobby's no good he's my son I love him he's no good and I'd ask him what was she talking about he said I'll tell you but now's not the time she was an old woman and she died and I have never in my life seen anybody suffer the way he did the day his mama died. In June, I had Robin, and then Fifteen months later, I had Camille. We were so broke, so he started exterminating. He said, I don't know how to do anything. He figured that was the only thing that he could do without going back into the life. 
all he wanted was me and the children sometime. They were totally my responsibility. She was like the, the head of the house. Um, she was the, dis the person who gave discipline. She was the person who made meals, um, rules. Anytime children did something wrong, honey, or I'm going to tell mommy, and all this kind of crap. He was a great dad. I mean, he could have been better, but we could all be better than what we are. From what he came from and to what he was trying to do, he didn't have any experience with kids. And then suddenly he has four. Three are girls. That's Three that of was them always... are girls. And he was in a position his entire life of putting his boot in the back of every single female that he came across. My dad used to say it was a curse. This must be my sentence before death. The three of you, when we were younger, they lived on 90th and Crenshaw in a black neighborhood. And someone threw a brick at Melody when she was four. It hit her in the head. She's like a four-year-old baby playing. And I think that that scene in his mind kind of set the stage for, wow, I've got these mixed kids, this white woman, you know, and people were angry. It took 14,000 troops to bring an end to what both Negro and white leaders called insurrection by hoodlums. When they had that terrible riot, it was bad. He told me to keep the children in that bedroom and to keep that bedroom locked, and I wasn't to come out of that bedroom until I heard his voice, because he was scared that something was going to happen. He said, you have to realize, I ain't never, ever going to be accepted in the white world. And we'll never be able to live anywhere except on the outskirts of the ghetto, where there's, there's a, a mixture of people. The census takers don't even, they don't even count people in the underworld. That's what I liked about it. You see, I didn't have to, uh, to, to be bruised and wounded in my efforts to make a living by coming in contact with white society. I was never reminded that I was a nigga. day long he would go and kill those roaches and rats and shit like that. He would come in nasty and sweaty and he hated it. Even then though, this man could not get up and go out in the streets without putting on a pair of dress pants and a dress shirt and a goddamn hat. When he got home from, from canvassing, as he called it, to find other jobs, he'd want to talk. And he would tell me these outrageous things. And I said, a woman would go out and sell herself and give the money to him. I said, you out of your goddamn mind. And then he would talk about the different experiences that he would have. I said, you know what? Give me a notepad. You start talking to me, and I'll start writing it down. And I did. After I put the children to bed, it was in there. And then he'd say, you think you can get any typing done tonight? And I'd say, I'll see. And 12, 1230, I'd go out and turn that typewriter on. She could type 160, yeah, 170 quick. words a minute. And he was really animated Yeah, and, and he excited. Would, and he would act out the whole book right there he would be telling me what to write down and i'm sitting in the chair and i'm writing and he's standing do you anyway and all up in my face he was a consummate actor absolutely she could put this thing together and act it out with him it was an amazing experience i wish that all of you could have seen it we could finish each other's sentences his stories they were so fascinating to me. 
I felt that if they were that fascinating to me, they obviously are going to be fascinating to, uh, to more than a million people. I had seen that ad in the Sentinel, the black newspaper for Los Angeles. The Holloway House was running a little ad for black writers. At that time, there was no venue for a uh, talented young black author, period. When you're attached to something like Holloway House, it's such an iconic place because of the fact that they are the doorway for so many unique American voices, like Joseph Nizel, Donald Goins, and Odie Hawkins. Bitley Morris, I think, should be considered a, a pioneer in one sense, but a drag in another. <laughs> Bentley. Bent, Bentley is this, this really epic personality. He was interested in a trajectory that kept them under the radar of, of fabulous success. Holloway House first came into being in 1961, we felt that we could not compete, but at least be a part of the world of publication. Now, we're not hardcover, we're paperback, which is the low ring of publishing. It was a third tier publisher, which would, at that point in time, lock you out, freeze you out of the, uh, the New York literary scene. I thought he did a lousy job bringing out books with the lousy covers. He did almost nothing to promote the books. They were almost sold by word of mouth. They were sold in uh, drugstores and newsstands. That's how you find your Holloway House books. They didn't want to call their books African-American books. They wanted to call them books from the black experience. Bentley is not a racist in any kind of way. If they could find a way that you could make money for them, they didn't care who you were. They were willing to exploit anyone who can make money for them. We were not proselytizers. We, were not, we weren't socially inclined. We were in the business to make money. But with it was the additional caveat of you're doing something good. You're doing something important. And hey, you know, that's a great formula. I asked Bob why he didn't find out what these people required, and let's see if it's sellable, because if it's sellable, then we're sitting here struggling like this with no money to feed the kids, no milk money, no cigarette money, no nothing, barely getting by on the rent. I said, we don't have to live like, because writers make money. And I got 100 pages together, and he took it to Bentley Morris. I can see him at the door at this moment, just immaculate. This extraordinary human being of about, I think about 6'3 in height, uh, came and said he's an author and he'd like to leave a manuscript. The editor at the time was a chap by the name of Milton Van Sickle. He read it, brought it into me, and I said, wow. It was such a revelation to receive a book with such intensity and with such truthfulness. Bentley Morris gave us a $5,000 advance, man, we were down to five. You got $5, somebody gonna cut you a check for five grand. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna give them that portion of your work and then promise them that the rest of it be delivered within two months? And that's what we did. Certainly, him coming up with the nom de plume of Iceberg Slim was an extremely clever writer's device because it tells you right in the name, Slim, okay, he's good-looking, he's cat-like. Iceberg, he's cold, cold, cold. And only the tip of the iceberg showed just what he wanted you to see. Most of it was hidden from view. He said, no, nah, on the street, they called me Kavanaugh. That was my name, Kavanaugh. Everybody was enthralled by the book. And we figured, let's go. Kemp was the first real book about the street life 
and the first real black experience put into a book form. You have James Baldwin, for example, or Ralph Ellison, very literate black writers who did not reflect the nitty gritty of life on the street. Iceberg Slim was the real thing. It was insightful in terms of the life of the street itself. You take something very gory or simple, but you bring poetry to it somehow. The delivery is so poetic in nature that you are falling in love with the words, even though they're words of violence and words of turmoil and terror. It was so intriguing. Here I am, little girl, young girl, and I'm reading this stuff about pimps and drugs and prostitution. And you know, your imagination just goes haywire. Just doesn't sound like anything else or feel like anything else. It's a snapshot of things you're never going to be able to see. You can crack any page on the book and read out a paragraph, and it's the craziest shit you've ever heard. It's not just the game, it's the pain of the game. He really tells you where this pimp is from and takes you into everything this pimp has gone through and what has made this pimp. It was raw to be able to write about such things in a way that captures the essence of what has transpired, as well as giving these events a certain literary flair, is, I think, what makes uh, Pimp stand out. Unrelentingly brutal. And, and Iceberg Slim's writing is so vivid and so clear, he makes it all inescapable. A whole book is gripping. You cannot put it down. The shit was so deep, written in deep slang, you know, a lot of people even heard that and didn't know what the fuck Iceberg was talking about. And that was the cool part about it, you know? His publisher didn't understand the damn book. Uh, said to him, uh, uh, these terms that you use, catching, blowing, tricking, uh, bitches, bottom woman, I don't understand what you're talking about. So I asked Bob, uh, would he endeavor to compile a section of glossary in definition of some of the phrases. He's going to be delighted to. Chili Pimp is defined as a small-time pimp, probably only has one hoe working for him, and he's new to the game. The bottom bitch is the pimp's main woman, who runs all the other hoes. Vic, or a trick, that's a mark, or a victim. Why a trick? The trick pays for something that a real man gets for free. That's the trick of it. And then when he did that, and I reread the book, and I reread it many, many, many times, and I had the glossary to refer to, I felt I knew what I was reading. He really laid out the, the etiquette of the pimp, the gentleman of leisure. You know, how flamboyant and how fly can this lifestyle be? There was obviously a romantic element that appealed to a young black man of, gee, that'd be a great life to have. The way he articulates his words and through his lifestyle, it makes Pippin seem fun. It makes Pippin seem like it's the coolest shit in the world. But really, it's not. It's a tough sport. When you're street poisoned, uh, a youngster reads the, reads the book and he rationalizes. You see, uh, we must have a rationale for stupidity. Anytime we do something stupid, we first got to convince ourselves that we've got to do that stupid thing. So they rationalize, oh, this stud, uh, I'm hipper than this. Uh, I won't get cracked. You know, I won't get caught. I won't, I won't go to, to the joint. I won't go to the penitentiary. I won't use drugs. I won't use heroin. I won't get hooked. I won't be a junkie. I'll be cooler, you know? Said so the dude is righteous, but I'm more righteous. You know, so I'm more together than this dude. So this dude is old, you know. You see, this is a rationale, and that's unfortunate. Uh, in L.A., where I've been living uh, for the last 10, 10 years, uh, just hordes of youngsters uh, approach me on the street, and they uh, try to pick my brain for the uh, hidden treasures they think are buried inside my skull. And uh, I always slap their wrist.
years before they reach for it. He just wanted young black people to realize that your head can help you get on a higher plane. And he he deglamorized it. He took all the glamour out of that. We felt this was going to be an unusual book, and so we pursued unusual methods. And there was a chap by the name of Joe Pine on KTTV who ran wild interviews of the most bizarre and offbeat people, but he had an incredible audience. And so we called KTTV and presented to them the possibility of this author. Would he like to do an interview? Put him on, and all hell broke loose. This is not one of the Reverend's evil spirits. Our guest masquerades under the name of Iceberg Slim. Many of you remember his story of his days as a procurer, or if you will, a pimp. Now he leads a respectable family life. Iceberg Slim has gone straight. And for this reason, he continues to hide his identity. It's uh, really paying you to go straight. Oh, yes, this is a better bag, as they say. <laughs> you don't miss all that excitement, huh? Oh, of course not. I mean, um... You get to keep your money now. That's right, and Pimp is a runaway bestseller. Is that right? They can't keep them in... They can't keep them on the stands. We couldn't... We couldn't keep the phone silent. Uh, we didn't have time to punch 9-11 if we had to, because calls were coming in. Where can I buy the book? When we got that box of books, and he brought them home with Pimp, you should have seen the dance that I did. And I said, I told you, God damn it, look at this. Didn't I tell you this was a book? Didn't I tell you? And he said, so what should be the next one? He returns now to tell us about the most incredible con man he ever knew, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Negro called White Folks. <laughs> You're not putting this on, are you, Slim? No, that's, that's, uh, that's factual. One of the things that Slim is incredibly brilliant at doing is being able to impersonate the voices of many people at once. Uh, how did he get that name? Because of the fact that he could pass over the line, over the color line? Oh, that's right. White folks was a term applied to him by his friends. Uh, his enemies in the black ghetto called him Trick Baby. Uh, the name of your book is Trick Baby. That's right. Here's what's great about Trick Baby. This is the structure of it. Because what it starts with is Iceberg himself being in the jail cell. And in comes what he perceives to be this white cat gets put to a cell. And then Iceberg then proceeds to tell you this story. But the story is told from first person from white folks' point of view. Iceberg Slim's talent is the ability, the uncanny ability, to be able to memorize these snippets of conversation that he's had throughout his life and construct them into narratives and characters. The book uh, is an incredible adventure story of the con as it's played in the street. And I might add, because it's told in first person, it's classic noir structure. I haven't had a chance to read this, but he knows I read his other one, and I just got this at this moment. If this is anything like your first book, uh, it ought to really do well. When a book reaches the level of a motion picture, uh, the capability for exploitation is enormous. It's in 1972, Trick Baby became a film. Trick Baby, Iceberg Slim's best-selling gut story of the world of the con the hustlers, the high rollers, and the hatchet men who made it up. His white skin gives us a slick edge. I catch the black marks, he catches the hunks. Trick baby. Iceberg Slim wrote it the way he lived it. It's his world. Sometimes brutal, but always real. Trick baby. Rated R. See it. Trick baby came out in January 1973 from Universal Pictures, and was really one of the first so-called black exploitation films to be based on a true story. I wasn't really a fan of the black exploitation films that I'd seen, and I didn't consider Trick Baby to be one. It was a con man story. There were lines of pimps and hustlers around the block in every city to see this film. 
we got $25,000 from Universal, and he came home with it. He t cashed the check and brought it all in cash, naturally. And he threw a full-length white mink coat out on the bed and then all these $100 bills. He said, so what do you think of that? And I said, we can get the hell out of this house. And I said, and what is this? He said, a white mink coat. And I said, I never told you I wanted a white mink coat. I don't like coats. You're going to wear this one. So I got a $10,000 white mink coat. I never saw Robert in a state of euphoria. It was all very even. But he went from this platform, a literary, into film. He experienced that moment in the sun. Well, I actually tried to pimp with an Iceberg Slim book. I'll never forget one time, we and my, one of my partners named Gary, we had some hoes, you know, so I got in my little pimp suit, you know what I'm saying? So we showed up, so, you know, we chopping them. We like, yeah, baby, you know, we real live pimping. You know, it's pimping jumping off. But these was real hoes, so they been around pimps. So, of course, they knew, you know, so we trying to pimp on them. And, uh, you know, in the middle of the pimping, we running into the other room, breaking iceberg slim books open, like, yo. And then running back, yo, bitch. Then you bitch, you know. And they like, how long have you been doing this? <laughs> the next day, the, uh, the two hoes woke up and stole his car. After he wrote Trick Baby in 1967, he published Mama Black Widow in 1969, the story of an African-American homosexual. Homosexuality in those days was taboo. If you were in the closet, you were in the closet. He really took those characters from the depths of society and brought them to the audience that he had. I was especially interested in his book of essays, The Naked Soul of Iceberg Slim, which was a collection of his thoughts on political and cultural issues. He also has a letter to his father in which he tries to invite him back into his life. Some of the chapters, if you read them intensely, uh, literally draws tears because they're so confessional. After The Naked Soul of Iceberg Slim, he publishes Death Wish in 1977. It's a story about the mafia. He shows an artistic maturity by being able to envision lives that he did not necessarily directly have contact with. In the book, the character Trick Baby basically is willing to play a deep hustle or a deep con. After reading the books, somebody said, you know dude got an album. I'm like, what? I was stalking hoes in the center of town right in the middle of the square, waiting for my man, because I had a plan to cop some reefer there. And I was flying fairly high, just standing there digging the holes. Oh, shit. I mean, it was just like his voice and the way he, bitch, dry your tears. Now we had a voice to add to the words. As kids, picking that little bit of life up changed our whole style. We got turned out. I mean, my whole crew got turned out. The very life that had shaped him and the very life that he could then turn around and write in a literary way and reflect on, which should have then catapulted him out of that life. At the same time then, because he's writing for um, a third tier house, even though, that, even though those books are selling, he has to still then step back into the life just to put food on the table at the same time that he's writing about it. That's like the double life, the double life of, of Robert Beck. The first time I really saw Slim was in the Parisian room on La Brea in Washington here in Los Angeles. And he would sit there and then his leaders would come in and 
they would give him money for one night. I hear this commotion. I run back there in the back to see what is going on, you know. He said, this bitch bring me 50 fucking dollars and she been gone all day. And he said, bitch, where in the fuck you been all day? She said, well, I had my period and I just, I just didn't feel well. He said, you ain't got locked, Joe, have you? You think he was still pimping? Because you, someone told you that, huh? Pimping who? For what, what would be the reason, though, the purpose? Like a stable of girls going out and, and who told you that? He used to move, like, these hookers into the house. Whatever but they were his assistants. They were, like, supposed to be assistants. Or publicists. Uh, but Beth there Bratton. was a lot of traffic between the rooms. I'd have to say 150%. That is not true. My mom was psychotic. There's no way. I mean, yeah, he had sex with other women, but making money off of them? Mm-mm. Reformed. Airtight Willie and Me, a collection of short stories, is his last book to be published by Holloway House in 1979. For each one of those books, we were getting advances from Bentley. And then royalties. And Bentley would pay whatever he wanted to on royalties. Well, the royalty statements of Holloway House are really comical because you know that they're a farce and they they have no bearing to any kind of reality. I'm happy when my you know when my beer money comes in the form of my royalty check. Well, we were a small house. Uh, we had very modest type of financing. Uh, we'd lay it on the line to the uh, author. This is what we pay, and if you can live with it. We'll become partners. It was never that an author was working for Holloway. It was always a partnership. How many authors did not take you up on your offer? None. There was a story about, told about Bentley where one of his writers goes to him, listen, I know you're cheating me and you need to pay me more. And Bentley sat behind his desk got up, walked to his window, looked down at the street down at Melrose below at the cars going by and saying, you see that street out there? Yes. <laughs> you know, there are scores of writers down there. I could throw a rock down there and kill 20 writers. I don't need you. You know, if you want to continue to be published by me, you shut the fuck up and take what I give you. He sent me down there when Bentley had to be motherfucked. Because Bentley wouldn't send the goddamn royalty checks out. And then he started looking at the breakdown sheets, and he was like, they sold, mm -hmm. but the checks don't, don't, add, up, it. don't never add up do. to the numbers of the books that are sold. They always received the amount of money that they should have received. We did an honest job. We never took advantage of our authors because they were, in effect, our bread and butter. Holloway would receive many calls for personal appearances, book signings, and so on. And uh, we would take advantage of everyone because it was additional promotion and merchandising. He was definitely out of the house a lot when the book started taking off. That was the distance between my parents. It was him just kind of off you know, becoming, you know, this writer, actually a pimp again is what she would say. You know, he's back out there and then she's left at home with four kids. She was unhappy and that made for an unhappy union. You just, you have no idea what it was like. I had four kids to feed, wash, clothes, house to clean, typing to do. And he's been diagnosed with diabetes. So I've got that, tra that trauma taking care of him. My mom was drinking a lot and really sad and depressed with my, my dad's philandering around town and things. I believe a lot of depression set in during that time too. He should have been better to me. However, he wasn't mean to me. 
and I was one that always started the arguments, and when they got really heated, he was the one that would leave the house. My mother used to call my father God when they were arguing. She would say, you're God, so you must know everything. And um, it wasn't a term of endearment. She did want a little bit of the limelight and kind of wanted to travel and do things with him. She probably wanted more of a celebration with, with our lives as far as us, like, now we have, like, you know, a nice house, and it only made him more distant. He was a total loner. The only one that he had that came on a consistent basis was R.G. Armstrong. And he and R.G. used to sit in there and write movie scripts. I said, Bob, why aren't you writing the novel? You haven't written a damn thing since we've been in the house. Why aren't you writing? How many more times do I have to go up there and motherfucker Jew to make him give me some more money to feed these children? And then I got a part-time job. And then he quit writing altogether. And I told him, I said, uh-uh, no, baby, we ain't pimping me, all right? I never paid a man's rent in my life, and I goddamn sure don't intend to start paying yours now. You either do what you know how to do, and let's get some money rolling in here, or you lay here on your dead ass, and I'm moving out with my children. And I did. He didn't want to leave his family. That's all he had. That's all he worked for was us. Yeah, I think my mom. He didn't just do that. Sh hold leave. on, hold on. I think she's the only one. He to didn't leave him. do that shit for any other reason but for his kids and his woman. And he had to leave because of her, because she was crazy and she was out of her mind. My father didn't know how to be in a relationship, whether it's with a woman, with a buddy, I mean, certainly not children. I still have not been able to unearth what it was, but there was some need that he had for me that just crushed him when I left because he didn't think I was going to do it. He just did not believe that I would leave him. years, he was living in a one-room efficiency over at 48th and Crenshaw. The sugar diabetes had taken its toll, and he was married at that time to another woman. After I read Death Wish, I wrote him a letter thanking him for writing it, and I never expected a response. Well, I had put my phone number in the letter, and a couple of weeks later, he called, and uh, we just started talking. But he only let her come by and visit. He was more in um, isolation, almost in seclusion. I think his health was really deteriorating, and it was, it was happening for some time. I want to say a good six years where he was going through dialysis. Once your body is failing on you, that pretty much takes away from your creativity. But, you know, he really did. Um, care about what was going on in the world. It was really important, world events. It was really important that we had the tools to enter whatever was happening in the world. You have to have a realization that when you exploit your own kind, that you are, in effect, counter-revolutionary, that you are hobbling and crippling the struggle of black people for freedom and dignity. He was my god. Are you kidding me? I knew that he knew shit that people, that most don't, people know, know, don't know, don't know. 
would never figure out or even try because they didn't have to, because they had a support system, something that he never had. I mean, when I got arrested that time, that was the only time I was arrested when he was alive. It's been many times since then. Oh, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, I got arrested with 10 kilos of cocaine and a million dollars cash. So they called my father because they wanted to give me 50 years. I thought that that would be a scary phone call to make, but it wasn't because he just took it all. Uh-huh. And then what did you have in your possession, my dear? Uh-huh. Nothing, Dad. I swear I would love. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, okay, I'm going to call the prosecutor right now and plead your case. Uh-huh. And he did. And I couldn't believe that. He didn't let anything stand and get in the way of him being able to deliver himself unto you if you needed it. He was very supportive as far as like giving you kind of an insight on what will come being a girl, being a woman. When I was a teenager, I didn't want to hear anything he had to say as any teenage girl, but he was giving me love. I didn't think it was love back then. I just thought he was, you know, this non-existing father. But now, obviously, yeah, that was love. the third day of the riots, the Los Angeles with the Rodney King thing. And it was pretty adamant that my father was not doing well. Gangrene had set in because of diabetes in his foot, and he was going to have to have some parts of it amputated. Melody called me at the office, and she said, Daddy's in the hospital, and they want to take his leg off. And he refused to let him take his leg off. And I said, Melody, call your dad back and tell him that I will be there to see him. And tell him I said good night. And he died that night. Every time that I put my hand out to try to show him that the animosity wasn't as strong and as raging as it had been in the beginning. If something bad would happen to him. I was in France. By the time I got here, he was already dead, and I knew it when the plane hit the tarmac. I got a call from Betty, and she said, Leon, Daddy's gone. I was one of the pallbearers at his funeral. I know they never have women pallbearers. But she was right in there. I was right in there. I never got a chance to be an adult and kind of apologize for being estranged from him. He died with us on a bad, bad terms, which, you know. Yeah, everyone has regrets, so. No one would know that he was as influential as he is even today, 20 years later, after his death. By the way that he lived and the things that he had, he had nothing. If I had known it was that bad, I think I would have gone and said, that's okay, I'll take care of you. I don't think I would let him, I don't think I would let him stay like that. I don't believe that I would. I couldn't. Because he was part of me. I mean, we made Iceberg Slim together. It wasn't a one-person process. It was a two-people-person process, you know? 
he was a wonderful person. And I love him. And I miss him. Iceberg Slim Books will always sell well. They, they always have sold well. And when we order them, we order, you know, 50 or 100 at a, a time to make sure that we never run out. Sometimes somebody will come in and literally pick up one of each because people want to pass them along to their friends and have the entire set. So it's interesting. The acceptance of Iceberg Slim uh, has been literally universal. If I'm correct, I believe it's eight or 10 uh, languages international publishers in the main are all people of high repute that felt that there was a great deal of worth here. He used to say, I could have been anything. I could have been somebody. I said, what the hell do you think you are? You're a writer that's read by millions and millions of people. You are somebody. To describe the life of Iceberg Slim, I would say it's not a it's not a story to glamorize a player's life. It's rather a story of redemption. His contribution to African-American literature uh, hasn't been touched by anyone. He was literally an icon in this genre. Iceberg Slim represents change. He represents, he's like a beacon of hope for anybody who's living in impoverished conditions that wants to change, you know, and is looking for that outlet. I am a New York Times bestselling author. And if it wasn't for Iceberg Slim, why wouldn't even have a platform? He's one of the pioneers, no doubt about it. The book company is called Cash Money Content, and we're definitely proud of the fact that we publish Iceberg Slim books. I think it's important that we protect his legacy. These books will live forever, guaranteed. Those of us that know Iceberg Slim, We'll put him with Baldwin and Chester Himes, Richard Wright, and Alex Haley even. As the rap gift for every movie I've ever done, I give out copies of Pimp to the whole cast and crew. All the questions of life can be answered if you read this book. From reading Iceberg Slims and really getting into it, I knew that that was the only way to tell a story, to tell both sides of it. Whenever you would listen to an Ice T record, it's the game, but it's the B side too. He really had like a big heart, even though he never showed anyone. I think that his heart was absolutely bursting inside of him half the time. Uh, you know, Brother Beck, uh, your autobiography, Pimp, uh, which you wrote. Uh, it may have encouraged a lot of young brothers to become, uh, to become pimps. How do you feel about this? I think it's very unfortunate uh, that there have been many uh, misguided uh, young black men who should know better, who missed the, the whole message in the book. And that was that uh, nothing good came to me except the penitentiary and, and a hair on habit uh, and misery and the, and the complete waste of my life, I stupidly tried to get something for nothing. And any time that you try to get something for nothing, you're gonna suffer one way or another.
Yeah. 